All right. Good morning. While everybody's loading in, I'm going to go ahead and start a poll just to kind of gauge everybody's interest and um, see what they're you know most looking forward to learning from this discussion today. So hopefully we can um, send everybody off with the information that they're they're looking for. All right. So it looks like, and I'll I'll share these results when we're done here. But it looks like we've got um, a decent amount of. Um, pro and homebrew cider makers slash beer brewers. Um, got a couple beer homebrewers looking to make cider. Um, so we hope to send everybody away with the fundamentals and, and just show you how how easy or complex it can be. We've got a couple uh, enthusiasts, so just uh, beer and cider nerds calling in. <laughs> it's awesome. Cool. Uh, thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, this Wednesday webcast series is something we've been doing for the, the better of six months now. Um, we've had a, a great time, um, you know, e-meeting everybody and bringing in guests like uh, Michelle here, which we'll um, introduce in just a second. Um, but, you know, this is a really fun topic and I think it's very um, timely. So Michelle is somebody that uh, White Labs has worked with in the past. Um, through some of our um, gluten reducing products and, and talking about some different types of cider yeast strains. So we're excited to uh, spend some time this morning and kind of walk through that relationship and um, explain who you are and your background a little bit more. Um, I'm Eric Fowler, for those of you who haven't tuned into these before. Um, I'm the education manager at White Lab, so um, get to do a lot of fun uh, webcasts and classes and stuff like this, as well as uh, work on our beer side quite a bit too. So Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So hey everyone, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Michelle. I'm located in New York. I know I'm in the opposite of where Eric is. Yeah, uh, you go here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, I am a cider maker and gluten-free brewer, gluten-free home brewer. Uh, I also work with various associations and companies on uh, education for these topics. Uh, I work through my blog, and many of you might know already, I work through my social media on my Instagram handle, at the Brew Babe. So uh, a little bit of who I am. Awesome. And uh, just some more logistical points on the way that this webcast or Zoom works. Um, if you do miss this or um, have to dip out early, um, you can find this in past webcasts on our YouTube channel. Um, usually takes about 24 hours for us to um, edit and upload it. If you do have questions and we really encourage participation, uh, please use the question and answer uh, box and I will monitor that and try to incorporate those into our discussion or uh, likely save them to the end depending on the relevancy of the slide that we're talking about. Uh, but today, you know, we are going to talk about really an overview of cider. So uh, what cider is, how it's generally made. You know, we're talking about hard cider in the context of this, um, different types of yeast strain and fermentation techniques you might want to use when making cider, um, and, and generally how you can uh, take those basic, basic concepts and um, make it at home or in return professionally. But those fundamentals are kind of the same across the board, no matter how experienced or inexperienced you are. So we hope to dive into that a little bit. Um, so really, like a broad overview, like what is cider, right? When I, when I think of fall, uh, I, I think of, so I'm based here in San Diego and we've, uh, you can get to the mountains and the, the ocean within an hour from each other. And you go up to Julian, uh, which is up in the mountains about 4,500 4, feet elevation, uh, get snow up there, but fall it's beautiful, right? So they do grow a lot of these heirloom apple, apple varieties. But I think of cider as just like hot mold cider that they sell on the side of the street. So what, what we're talking about today, like how is, how is that different or how is that similar? Like what is the cider we're talking about? Yeah, so great question. It's often uh, I speak about it. I know the American Cider Association really encourages other cider makers to speak about it as well. So there's juice and there's cider. And so we're working uh, towards... Um, I guess rebranding the word cider. Uh, initially, people think, you know, cider, they think about farm cider. It's usually hazy, fresh pressed, but we want to move away from that because that essentially that's juice. And cider is alcohol, right? It's a fermented beverage, um, alcoholic uh, beverage fermented from uh, apples. So if we could just uh, drop the hard part and just call it cider, uh, that's what we're speaking about today. So. 
helps to make yeah. that a little bit that, clearer. <laughs> yeah, that totally makes sense. And, you know, humanity has been fermenting anything with a carbohydrate source for a long time, right? Over 10,000 years, we've been taking something that has sugar, turning it into ethanol, right? And a, a lot of that has to do with what we look at now is flavor, but historically it was more preservation and a way to get calories and, you know, a way to, to not have something spoil very quickly. Um, why apples though, right? What is like, what are the, the attributes of apples when it comes to flavor, the type of apple and the historical context of that, right? Yeah. Why is it such an American tradition and, and what other uh, countries and regions do you see a lot of similarities? for, for yeah. cider. So uh, the apple tree, the very first apple tree was brought over uh, in the 1600s. Uh, it was pretty popular at the time, um, not just for cooking with it, but making cider, you know, uh, yeah, hard cider, cider. Uh, so right now we have about uh, 7,500 varieties around the world, 2,500 are in the States. Um, and it was a big deal. Um, but around the 1900s, there was like the temperance movement and prohibition and um, orchards started getting cut down and burned down. And at the same time, we had a bunch of uh, German settlers that came over and started making beer, started making lagers. And so uh, folks thought it was a great alternative to cider and uh, it took a hit, you know, at that time until now. So that's a little bit of the history, uh, a little history of how cider made it to the States what um so you know what being primarily somebody that works with a lot of beer right i've, I've worked with cidery meaderies wineries um, and distilleries but most of my day-to-day -day is working in the, the beer world so a lot of the lens that i look through has to do with beer but cideries always um kind of seem to be this outlier when it comes to like a, a, a volume of consumption right because there's a lot of people i don't like beer i like cider right. um, why is that? Like, what are the ingredients that make them so different, that make the, the flavors and aromas so different? And why are certain demographics, do you think, drawn to cider over another? And, and maybe even talk about the uh, gluten aspect of that as well. Yeah, sure. I'm very passionate about. You know, it's funny because you have folks that prefer cider, like you said, over beer. You know, maybe it's just they just like something fruity because not all cider is sweet i just want to come out and say that a lot there's a misconception you know first off that only women drink cider and that's not the case but also that oh, all cider is sweet also not the case but you know you have beer with grains and hops you know and cider you could have with hops which we'll get into in a bit but it's just straight up fermented juice you know just like wine um it's funny because cider doesn't necessarily like you said fall in the beer category it doesn't really fall in the wine one either it's like this weird in between um i wish i could find out why cider uh you know why there are more people that like would gravitate towards cider or beer but i know from personal experience i went into cider because i was diagnosed with a gluten allergy so i was a home brewer for a very long time um, and then when i was diagnosed with a gluten allergy like, all right, well, I can't drink beer, but I didn't know about gluten-free beer yet. And uh, I hated cider. I hated cider so much. I thought, I thought it all tastes the same. But um, when I did some research about the different styles, uh, the different types of apples used in cider making, I fell in love with it. And I learned that, you know what, maybe it's not, I don't like ever, all types of ciders, but I like ciders here and there. And uh, that's okay. And the same thing is with beer, right? Maybe you'll have someone who just loves sours, but like just can't drink stouts. You wouldn't go out and say, oh, I hate beer just because you had a sour and that was the only beer you had. So uh, I think a lot of it has to do with like education as well. And once people become more, um, they expand their palates and educate a little bit more of what cider is, that there is a possibility that they will fall in love with it just like I did. <laughs> yeah, and what I've seen too is there's a, adversity to bitterness right like if you think about bitterness um, as part of a flavor profile we've been conditioned to not enjoy bitter things bitter usually means poisonous right uh, and so you know a lot of beer is very bitter especially craft beer especially the stuff that people present a lot that pe people are really passionate about but that's not always the most accessible so i think when it comes to cider it's a it's a 
flavor profile that's a little more familiar, right? It's like you said, fruity generally. Right. Um, and it's got a lot of acid, which right. you acid know. and tannins, right? Mm -hmm. The malic acid in our apples. Uh, you know, you don't want it too tart. You don't want it, you know, um, and you don't want it not like like dull. You know, you want it to have some type of uh, some type of uh, complex flavors in there. Um, also, you know, tannins, astringency, you know, the bitterness that you're talking about. I mean, that's what makes, you know, the different types and levels of these talons to uh, tannins to acid ratio are what makes the cider, you know, pleasing to us. Yeah, which are kind of the same um, complementing aspects in, in other fruit wines, right? And I think that's what people are, are drawn to and again, already familiar with. So it, it makes sense. And it's almost surprising that uh, the numbers that you're showing here aren't even higher. Um, and that more people haven't been gravitating to it over the last couple of years as people um, start realizing where the products they're consuming come from. Um, I think the, I say this delicately, one of the benefits of um, the, of COVID and what we're experiencing right now is uh, people have become a little bit more aware of where their spending goes and what they're consuming. And trying to understand who they're supporting by it. And I think, you know, these agriculture-based products are uh, quintessentially American or wherever they're coming from, right? right? Because they're generally using products that are grown in that region, which is really cool. Right, which the Northeast has a ton of apples, right? So like, you know, you know upstate New York, Hudson Valley, even Long Island, there are orchards for us to get, you know, fresh pressed juice. Like there's a mill, like not even 15 minutes away from my house. And I don't live that far out from the city. I could go and pick up fresh juice if I want to, you know, just consume it or ferment it, you know, however I want to use it, it's my own choice. But, uh, you know, not every state is uh, fortunate to have an orchard down the street, you know? So I think that's also, uh, that comes into play as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that kind of segues us um, a little bit, like saying that you have a mill in there. Are they nearby? Are they looking to make juice for the general consumer who wants apple juice, who wants cider, or are they making something that's specific, uh, like using varieties to uh, cider, like uh, alcoholic cider? And why are they choosing certain varieties over another? And how are they choosing that? Is it based off of where they are and that's all that grows? Yeah. I think that a lot of it has to do with the climate. A lot of it has to do with the varieties. Um, a lot of the seedlings are blended, uh, you know, just the way that they're grown. You won't really know what you're getting. For the most part that I've seen, and obviously we'll get into the different types between like modern, you know, culinary apples and heirloom apples. For the most part, I've seen a ton of like culinary apples here on Long Island. Uh, you know, even when I recently just like went with my sister, like apple picking, like everything we saw was just like Gala, Fuji, Granny Smith, you know, it was just, um, you know, that's all we had available. Um, you know, we use that. It's great for cooking, you know, not, I don't like to use it for making cider, although I do use it for making cider because I had an instructor at uh, Cornell Agritech. There's a cider program, the Cider Institute of North America. And he, the first question he asked was, what's the best cider, uh, best apples to use to make cider? And like, everybody was like, like, you know, being a nerd and, you know, shooting all these like exotic names they thought, you know, and he said, no, the best cider, the best way to make cider, are the apples that are closest to you that are readily available that, you know, you can use, you know, if you're thinking as a professional. And so that's something that stuck with me, you know, so to answer your question, yeah, I mean, like, we do have the culinary apples here. And I think it's just what's what they have available in the orchard. And that's, it's been successful. And, you know, for the most part, the Long Islanders, you know, I know are just getting it for a juice, and maybe they're getting it to bake, or maybe they're just doing, you know, apple cinnamon baked in the oven, you know, they're not really thinking as far as making cider. I think that also has a, another, uh, you know, something that comes into play when they're you know, building mm -hmm. the orchard. Yeah, when we were, uh, we took our last trip up to the mountains a couple months ago and uh, we're walking down by this lake and there's all these heirloom apples hanging from a tree and you know, they're about this big and hard as a rock. And I picked one off and took a bite and my wife's like, what are you doing? You can't eat that. And I was just spit it out. And I was like, you're right, I can't eat it. <laughs> and it, it probably wasn't ripe, mind you. Oh, okay. but, you know, it's just like uh, a lot of those uh, more heirloom um, varieties don't taste necessarily good on their own, like a, a pink lady or a. Um, yeah, but they're great for making cider. 
<laughs> which is awesome. You know, it's awesome to do, you know, you could, it has many uses of apples depending on their style. So how, um, I see you've broken it out here based off yeah. of, um, acid and then uh, right. and some examples there like what are the general categories we're looking at for apples and like what would fall within that maybe that we would be familiar with yeah so like uh like i said before the the modern uh apples they're the culinary apples the ones that you would maybe find easily readily at the orchard or the farm or farm stands you know, those are the ones that are low in tannins and high in acid. And those are Gala and Fuji, Granny Smith. Um, those are great to use, like I said, for cooking or cooking, eating, baking, you know, um, in, and fermenting if you're really starting off as a home brewer. Um, but even if you're starting off professionally, getting a blend of those, a blend between obviously the modern and like the heirloom apples would be great. But, uh, you know, you could start with that. Uh, and then we have the heirloom apples. They are bitter sweet, bitter sharp. Uh, they're higher in tannins. They give more, more character uh, to the cider. So you have Kingston Black, got those mum crab apples like Wixen. Um, and yeah, some of them are listed right here on the slides so if people want to take a look to see what they are. Uh, that's where I would recommend uh, folks starting off. And these I assume are all pretty regional and yeah, so it depends on, uh, you know, not obviously every place will be able to grow everything, you know, like, just like you see the Florida orange juice commercial, right? It's grown in Florida. I mean, you don't have them as exactly growing in New York City. So yeah. it really depends on the climate. Yeah, California, fortunately, is so large and has so many microclimates, we can grow almost anything here. Uh, but it doesn't mean that people do, right? They're generally looking at cash crops, or yeah. uh, it can be pretty expensive. So you know, what I've made cider quite a bit and you and I have spoken about this offline, but I literally go to Sprouts or Trader Joe's or whatever and buy um, some apple cider that, you know, it's preservative free. So it's not going to kill off the yeast. Right. It adds nutrient and yeast and it tastes decent, right? It's not mind blowing, but for how easy, yeah. it's really great. I'm probably getting some of those what I would assume is like sweeter um, apple varieties in that, like blended for consistency yeah, and yeah. just for taste. Okay. Yeah. And also, um, you know, I learned as a home brewer, he had like malic acid. That's like that, the acid you would find in like apples. So um, I would add that you can get that at like a home brew shop. I used to add it, um, you could add in primary, or secondary. Um, I used to add it in secondary. And then I was told that people can actually taste it. It's almost like, I don't know how true this is, but, or how sensitive your palate is, but uh, it tastes uh, almost, I don't want to say the fake, you know, the artificial flavoring mm -hmm. of it, but I started adding it in primary um, just to kind of make it more robust and ensure that I'm going to get something a little bit better than Mott's apple juice or, you know, Trader mm -hmm. Joe's, you know, juice. Um, but that's not also not a bad way to start. In fact, I was making a couple of ciders for some friends. I made um, a pumpkin spice one, which I have here. It's afternoon, so maybe I'll enjoy some in a bit that I added spices to it. And uh, I have another one going downstairs in my living room. Uh, and I was so lazy. I literally bought Adam's, I think it's called Adam and Eve apple juice. You know, as long as there's no preserves or anything, I like just dump the yeast in there and put an airlock in there, a little bit of sugar and airlock and good to go. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll throw some apricots. I have a friend who wants an apricot cider and that's how simple it can be, but it can also be more complex. And obviously there are a lot of other things that you have to consider when you're making cider, especially on a professional scale. Uh, but that's the basic idea of it. And, um, yeah, I feel like anyone, I feel like if you could bake a cake, you can brew. If you could bake a cake, you know, you can make some cider at home. Um, so I, we got a question and this um, next styles of cider kind of relates to it, but um, could you touch on um, like what it's even mean by standard styles and then specialty yeah. styles? Like I've, you know, when I was first introduced to cider, um, there was a couple of local cideries, but it was primarily like woodchuck in the grocery store, right? right. And a lot of those were really sweet, but what I started to see through different seasons was great marketing, but they did a lot of different flavors and stuff that I wouldn't have never really thought um, applied to cider. I think there was a, a barrel aged one and different alcohol strengths and 
Um, yeah, Ender Orchard does something, I think, called Wooden Sleeper, and that's a barrel age one as well. Yeah, and it was, I was living in Virginia at the time, so it, it definitely hit the spot that time of year, right? Uh, but uh, we'll get to um, Brian's question that he submitted in just a second, but could you touch on, again, what what it means by standard style and specialty styles? Yeah, sure. Um, so the standard styles we have are modern and heritage. So modern are the culinary apples that you would find. Uh, and then we have the uh, heritage ones uh, and those are heirloom apples. So those are the ones that might be a little bit tougher for you to find. They're not necessarily the eating ones. Um, so those, and they have obviously different tannins and acid depending on the apples. And now you have the specialty styles, right? And so the specialty styles, they range from fruit, hopped, uh, botanical. We've got some rosé that are really popular this summer. So like the fruit ciders, you would have like blackberry or pomegranate, like adjuncts. Um, hop ciders, they're my favorite. If you're a beer lover, they could be your favorite as well. Uh, and those are made with hops, um, you know, like Citra, Crystal, Cascade, uh, you know, the world is your oyster. So whatever hops you feel that you want to use or a blend of them, you can. Uh, it, it does, it is a little difficult to make hop ciders. Uh, I feel like people get too hoppy with them or too happy and they throw a bunch of them, you know, double dry hop with like all this stuff. And uh, it doesn't really take as well as like beer. So you gotta be very careful on how like much and like what you use with the apples, with the cider when you're uh, fermenting. Um, and then we have botanical ciders. Uh, those actually have been quite popular, uh, I've noticed. Uh, you know, those are made with herbs and teas. Um, I've seen them with like white teas. I've seen cider with like strawberry basil, you know, basil ciders. And it's like, wow, like I, you know, it's just amazing how crafty cider can get. Just like, you know, in the beer world, how crafty they're getting, how creative they're getting. Cider is uh, doing the same thing. Um, I, when I make my botanical cider, I like to make tinctures. Um, and so essentially it's just like vodka and then I'll throw in tea leaves. Uh, you can brew the tea in there if you want to, but I, I, this is how I make it. So you could put the tea leaves, you could put the spices, whatever you need in that like mason jar with vodka. And then I just kind of shake it up and I'll leave it for a couple days. And then like, I'll take my cider when I'm done and measure out like how much I want to put in that, that little, uh, sample. And then I'll just like scale it up. I mean, that's, you don't have to go crazy like that, but that's how I did my pumpkin cider because my sister and my friends like wanted a pumpkin cider. And so I used like a cinnamon nutmeg and um, I feel like I used something else. Might have used something else in there. And that's how I was able to do it. I'm sorry. Probably some allspice in there. Yeah, I was thinking, I think it was like allspice as well. Um, yeah, so that's for botanical. Uh, wood age cider, the ones we were talking about, you're right. You said like there might've been like a woodchuck. I know one that's an angry orchard. I know um, for a uh, homebrew level, um, often you'll use like uh, oak chips or spirals. Um, I like to soak mine in bourbon and then use that in my cider. Um, it can be a little bit of overkill if you put too much in and then all you taste is straight up bourbon. Mm -hmm. Not bad if you love bourbon, but uh, it can just take away from the apple character and um, pretty unfortunate when that happens you know you want yeah. to keep it I made a, a couple gallons of cider that I put on tap a couple years ago and over winter I would throw a stick of cinnamon I'd pull it and actually put a little shot of bourbon in there too yeah uh, make a little it's, cocktail out of it and it was awesome but yeah so bad. people people I mean as far as like you know I've had folks ask like oh my god you dump vodka in your cider you know to, to get because it gives it the flavor and the aroma without giving the sweetness and I like my dry ciders um, you know, like obviously there's like dry, semi-dry, um, semi-sweet and sweet ciders, right? So like I like mine that are dry. And so I use my tinctures to kind of control that. But like a little vodka with that that flavor, like that's not going to, you know, knock knock me on the floor. It's not going to get you like wasted. It's just a little bit in like a five gallon batch. Like you're not using a whole lot. And so it's okay to like use those tinctures in your homebrew. So, yeah. so um, going back to, to Brian here's question, he was asking about dry hopping ciders. Um, he says he's been adding uh, an ounce and a half or two ounces for about three days, but thinks that they can go longer. What do you think? Maybe seven yeah. days? Seven days. I would go for a week. I usually leave mine for a week, five to seven days. And you'll do about two ounces per five gallons? Uh, 
Actually, I think I've done one ounce per five gallons before. I think that's my recipe, an ounce for the five gallons. Yeah, that, um, those, those, those ranges sound about, about right. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think you're going to do anything wrong with adding a little bit more. I use a hop bag. You can just throw it in and just like let it sit. Um, but yeah, I leave that, you know, in secondary for about a week. I have to filter it because obviously like there's just so much like gook on the bottom, <laughs> the, you know, the hops and the like uh, the drops down and it's just uh, got to filter it, especially with cider a couple of times. Yeah. Unless you like it. Ha I mean, I like my cider hazy, so I don't filter it too much. I just do it one time. You know, before I uh, before I keg it, but um, gotta be careful with that, especially when you're kegging. I've had my uh, my quarantine kegs clogged a couple times at the festival. I'm infamous for having issues with that because I love my hop ciders. <laughs> so just be careful with that. Um, and then there's a he followed up with questions about yeast strain, which I'll kind of get to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On the other slides, but yeah. uh, one of the other questions: Can you get the slide presentation? Uh, go ahead and email me after. Um, you'll get emails from Zoom and just respond, yeah. and I can send that over to anybody interested. Yeah. Um, have you ever used hops in primary, or are you always looking at secondary? And, and I guess before you answer that, um, the only detriment to leaving hops in there too long would be um, to start pulling vegetal flavors and aromas. When you're working with an ounce to five gallons, it's probably not a huge issue, but if you're using with uh, a lot of large uh, quantities of, of hops and whole leaf specifically, and you throw it in there and leave it for a week or two, um, it might not taste as great as that three to five, maybe even seven day uh, period. Yeah, absolutely. I have to agree with you on that one. Uh, like I said, it depends also like what hops you're using. I mean, mm -hmm. I've judged competitions where it's like, yeah, I love the hop category. I got to say, I don't think a lot of the judges like it's not about what you like, but I get excited for the hop category. And a lot of times I'll get like entries. I'll have like seven different types of hops that like don't even like match. And it's just, you don't know what you're drinking. And sometimes it's easier to just go simple. If you want to just do like Citra, then just do Citra. If you want to do, you know, Amarillo, just do that or galaxy or mosaic, just do one or do two, you know? Uh, but it's fun, you know, like home brewing's about experimenting and, having fun so you know so that's you know don't forget that so check that out <laughs> um have you ever dry hopped mid fermentation or or during primary uh no yeah, you can definitely do it uh i know like professionally uh people they do that uh they do it before or they'll you know add the hot bags later um but i on a homebrew level i just do in secondary it's just something um that i know i can control better I yeah, I, I would agree to that. I would assume, um, you know, you have a lot of um, vigor and there's a lot of activity during primary fermentation. There's a lot of CO2 production. And if you um, hop or dry hop during that, you're actually going to blow off a lot of those volatiles. So you're probably going to end up um, not capturing as much of that flavor and aroma as you'd want. So for all intents and purposes, I would say um, secondary is probably preferable, but like you said, you know, it's like $2 of hops and it's fun. Like worse comes to worse, it tastes more like apples, which isn't a bad thing either. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how's, how is cider made, right? What, so we have apples or we have juice, like at okay. what point does the cider maker play a role? Yeah, so um, obviously on a homebrew level, you know, it's different on a professional level, but the process is pretty similar, spot on. Obviously there are things that readings that you take as a professional compared to homebrew. Um, and so, you know, the first step is harvesting, you know, collecting the apples, right? So uh, the apples that are harvested, uh, you know, if you have a for farm, you're fortunate to have your apples. Um, if not, um, you know, you're actually going to get skipped down to number three. Uh, I know most cider makers skip down to number three, but the first step is obviously harvesting the apples. The next one is milling and pressing it. So grinding on the apples and pressing the juice. Um, I have something at home uh, that actually it's uh, it's like a, a grinder like with a hopper and you just dump the apples in. And I have actually a whole assembly line when I do it. My mom, my sister, I'm like, all right, guys, we've got a bunch of apples. We're doing this today. And so... <laughs> Who's going to be, you know, obviously we wash ours, but like who's going to be grinding the apples and then it gets transferred and we press it, we uh, juice it, right? We get all the juice in there. And so like, if you don't have your setup, obviously you don't do number one, number two, 
um, home brewer or commercial, I'm sorry, home cider maker or professional cider maker, you skip down to collecting the juice and you ferment it. You select the yeast that you want. Um, obviously get to know your yeast, uh, get to know, you know, it's very, you'll I'm sure touch upon it soon, but you know, it's important to uh, follow the temperature of the yeast and make it happy. Um, and then the next step uh, is racking. So a uh, fancy word, you transfer it. So uh, at this point, you can filter it. I usually filter my cider at this point. Um, and then uh, the next step, number five, is blending it. So you can blend it with other juices. Uh, you can use fruits. I, I usually add things that, um, if I'm making a specialty cider in secondary, that's where I'll add like my wood chips that had been soaked or rather the tincture that had the wood chip soap in the bourbon, I'll add that. Um, and then I'll add, um, if I'm doing maybe, I don't know, a pomegranate cider, I'll add that at that stage. And then the last stage is packaging. So um, whether you're using a bright tank at a cidery or you know, you're canning it, uh, that's your stage. For home brewers, you'd be bottling and you'd be uh, kegging. But we have a fancy little chart to the right if you folks want to look at it in detail. That's uh, taken from my textbook from uh, Cornell Agritech's uh, certi certification program in detail. Awesome. So obviously my favorite part, uh, <laughs> talking about the yeast and fermentation side of it, because I think it uh, often gets overlooked, especially with um, terroir driven beverages. So, you know, you, you hear wine, you uh, talk about single malt scotch, and then obviously cider. You know, the, the emphasis, as it should be, is on the, you know, the, the ag agricultural product that you're actually going to ferment. So, you want to know that you have high quality juice or apples to make juice. You want to know what flavors and acids and um, sugar content they're going to bring to the table. But really understanding that you're using the right yeast strain is, is super important because there's going to be a lot more um, flavor and aroma contribution than people might give it credit for. And in return, it might even um, accentuate or diminish characteristics of that variety that, that you might not be aware of. So it's, it's really important to know both sides of what you're working with and every raw ingredient you're working with. Uh, so the flavor production is going to vary by yeast strain quite a bit. There are um, tried and true strains for producing cider, uh, and that's for a reason, right? We know that certain strains behave really consistently, work with a wide variety of temperatures, sugar content, um, apple varieties. But when it comes down to it, yeast overall contribute more than 500 flavor and aroma compounds to, sorry, it says beer, but it should say cider, um, meaning that there's a big impact that you might not perceive. And that doesn't mean that there's 500 um, metabolites or fermentation byproducts that you can smell and taste, but it means that there's 500 that has the potential, or maybe they work together in a matrix, right? Uh, to again, accentuate or diminish certain aspects. Somebody in the, in the chat mentioned biotransformation. So there's certain yeast strains that will take other present compounds and change them into other things, most notably, uh, taking different types of sugars and converting it into ethanol and CO2, right? So those are some of those um, byproducts that you can perceive in some aspects. So it's important to know how that yeast strain is going to take those sugars and other uh, volatile uh, flavors and aromas and, and turn them into something positive. Um, some of the yeast strains that we talk about the most is a 775 English cider yeast, which I think somebody mentioned in the uh, chat as well. This is uh, my personal favorite strain to make cider with, and I think it's because I've had the most experience with it. Um, I've used it the most. Um, I've worked with a lot of customers and um, home brewers and professional cider makers that have used it quite a bit. So it's very well known, um, and it does produce a great cider. It, it produces a very minimal amount of fruit, but still leaves um, some of the sharpness of the juice you're working with. But with that said, I think that it's used the most because of how it's labeled. It's labeled as English cider yeast. So when I'm going to a homebrew store and I've never made cider before, it's probably the strain I'm gonna pick because it says cider right on the label. 
Um, and that's because that strain has, is sourced from traditional English cideries, right? Um, so you can get a good idea of looking at the way that, at least speaking for white labs, the way our yeast strains are named. Um, they're named generally because they're sourced from um, an area that's known for certain beer styles or producing certain types of uh, beer or cider or wine. Um, in this case, English cider yeast. So it's uh, very logical to deduce that this strain came from a very prominent uh, English cidery that kind of defines a certain style. Um, so the yeast strain can help deliver that. Uh, but there are a lot of um, beer strains that work well with cider too, right? So you want to be... Absolutely. You know, yeah. I'm a fan of those beer strains. <laughs> yeah, and they get overlooked a lot, right? Because people see... Yeah, uh, right here. <laughs> awesome. Uh, you know, yeah, people will see, you know, uh, California Ale East or British Ale East. And um, as, as one of the other comments said, uh, WP566, which is our Saison 2 Ale East, made, used generally to make Belgian Saison type beers. But those strains, uh, for the most part, have the ability to produce this, to, to convert the simple sugars found in cider just fine. They need a little bit more nutrition than they do in beer, which we'll get to in a minute, but they can still produce um, great aromatics and, and fully attenuate the cider and, and produce something that's really crisp and tasty and, and showcases um, the, the fruit profile. In the case of the Saison strain though, uh, and that, that's an interesting thing that I probably should have put on here. It didn't jump to top of mind when I wrote this list. Um, a lot of Belgian strains are what's called POF positive or phenolic off flavor positive, kind of a, almost a double negative kind of there. Uh, but what that means is uh, it produces these compounds called phenols that are generally perceived as um, clove, like if you've ever had a Hefeweizen. Um, or in a Saison as like black pepper. And that I think can be either a, a big positive in a cider or a big negative, depending on what you're going for. Um, but, you know, traditionally when a lot of ciders are produced and they probably use these native fermentations, meaning yeast that was already on the apple, just like you see in a lot of wines still today, um, there was probably a lot of wild yeast that, uh, produce these phenolic compounds. And um, if you've ever, ever worked or had a Britannomyces influence uh, cider or wine, you'll know it's there. They're very dominant, very polarizing, and very expressive. So generally people stay away from that. But with that said, there are a, a lot of cool opportunities in experimentation that people could be doing by using not just English cider yeast, right? Using beer strains, using Belgian beer strains, using wild yeast strains, um, and they'll all ferment out and produce, um, you know, pretty tasty ciders. Yeah, you see commercially, uh, commercially as well. Um, you know, there's really nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, and you'll see a lot of. Uh, it's it's kind of like a new wave. I saw it about two years ago, of cideries producing sour ciders. You know hazy, unfiltered, you know, and there's a whole group of people that do gravitate towards that style. I'm one of those people. Um, and um, a lot of beer enthusiasts I've noticed tend to enjoy ciders like that, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's kind of funny because, you know, sour is also a polarizing term. And most ciders to me aren't sour, but they're tart, right? Tart sounds a little bit more palatable. It sounds like something I want to drink as opposed to sour. But when you look at the acidity present and the pH of sour beer and cider and wine, they're pretty similar. They're all in the, the low to mid threes. So it's funny to, to hear sour cider to me because to me, it's like all, all ciders already have acid, but I think it's more of a um, breaking that barrier of entry to people that, well, I know sour beer and I know I like those. So labeling something like that, or, a, you know, a, a cider type IPA or a hopped cider, right. it just brings people in that maybe haven't experienced it before. Um, we've got, so nutrition is um, very key and very important. Um, you know, when you're working with beer, malt fortunately has, um, pretty much all the nutrients that yeast need for a complete healthy fermentation. Um, 
cider, wine, mead, not so much. Um, they might have a small amount, but generally what they're lacking in is nitrogen. Um, so adding that nitrogen from an external source is really important. Um, something like Seltzer Max is a, is a new nutrient that we released in the last couple months uh, due to hard seltzer. So just like cider and mead, um, utilizing a simple sugar that's very nutrient deprived, hard seltzer just, you know, we'll use uh, also a very simple sugar to produce uh, something very flavorless and alcoholic. So we developed something that was nutrient rich that's actually really great in uh, in multiple beverages. Uh, White Labs yeast nutrients a good one. Servomyces is a great one too. Um, you get a lot of nitrogen source um, and a lot of amino acids present um, in some of the yeast that's in that nutrient. Uh, but point being, you want to use something to supplement that. Um, if you don't, you can still very well end up with a uh, complete fermentation and completely dry it out, but there's a chance that you might see increased um, sulfur production or something undesirable without using um, adequate nutrition. So we'll get into um, some of the other Q&A in just a second, but again, I wanted to uh, thank everybody. Thank, thank you, Michelle, for taking time today. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking with you a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Um, and diving a little bit more and inspiring myself into cider. It's something that I haven't, you know, been as involved in in the last couple of years as I previously was. But um, this webcast series is something we generally do once a month. Um, as I mentioned, all past webcasts can be found on our YouTube channel. Um, just search White Labs or White Labs Inc. Uh, but next week, so this month we're actually doing two. Um, next month we've got Pat Fahey, who is the uh, I believe content director, master Cicerone of the Cicerone certification program. And we'll be looking at how yeast and fermentation um, is important when you're looking at higher education for um, service or just developing a better understanding of um, beer specifically. So if you have any questions, go ahead and shoot them um, into the Q&A. Yeah, it looks like there was a, a question about yeast nutrients, which was timely. Um, we got somebody else that says um, 720, which is a wine strain, works well too. Yeah, so that's... Um, yeah, a lot on. of cider makers, they gravitate usually to wine yeasts. Yeah. And um, uh, where... Eric, could... What did you use for your uh, home brew, the cider that you made last time we chat last week? Yeah, I used uh, 775 English cider yeast. I've um, been interested in trying to use some of these uh, Kvike strains that are popular. Um, we were talking about that. I had my first gluten-free one, first gluten-free beer, uh, yeah. and I was stoked to have, I think I have like one can left and like that's it. But yeah, I would be really interested in making one as well. Maybe you will have to come up with a recipe for that. Yeah, that would be super cool. Um, I, I like them because they're, they're easy to work with. Um, I don't have the homebrew setup that I used to. I used to have, you know, temperature control a pretty elaborate Even setup the flavor and, that you get like just everything just so like bursting and bold and exciting and yeah can't wait to try yeah. that <laughs> definitely um so yeah i wanted to thank you again um for for joining me today and, and talking about this and re reviewing what cider is and the general process of making it but if people have more questions for you um where can they find you yeah, so if you have Instagram at the Brew Babe, uh, you can feel free to send me a DM. My website has a ton of information, the outcask with a K dot com. Uh, and then I just launched a Patreon account uh, for folks that want to learn more on uh, like uh, amateur cider making, home brewing. I have recipes that I'm going to be releasing every month, uh, video and photo tutorials, and also live chat questions, Q and A, uh, in case you know you're have something that went wrong or a question, some type of advice, uh, you can definitely check me out. And that's uh, patreon.com slash the brew babe. So yeah, all the information on there. Awesome. And if anybody has um, additional, seeks additional information, they can uh, email me um, from the, the Zoom link that they got, or um, just check out our website at whitelabs.com. We've got an awesome catalog of um, nutrients, yeast strains, and recipes as well. So yeah, I wanted to um, just thank you again, and I hope that we can um, touch base and, and make these a uh, uh, common occurrence. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everyone okay. for joining. Yeah, thank you.